Hello everyone, sorry for the delay here, just getting my settings correct. It's uh, I'm a little bit rusty on this, so I apologize. Get started in here in just a second. Okay, so we are going to talk about a uh, Japanese hornet, and I'm going to do a lot of poly painting tonight as well as sculpting, so hopefully you guys can uh, see and hear me. Alrighty then, well, let's get started. Uh, thanks, Kyle, for all your help. Okay, sorry, that was a little bit of a mess. But let's take a look at what we got here. So this is a Hornet model that I've been working on for a while, and you guys might recognize it as the so-called Murder Hornet, although I prefer its actual name, which is Vespa Mandarinia. It is famous for um, basically, shall we say, attacking honeybee combs and... Uh, eating all the larvae and other nasty stuff like that. But you know what? Everybody's got to make a living, and so that's how this one lives. And uh, what I'm going to do is let me uh, pull up my reference on this so we can take a look. And so I actually organized my files like this because I'm a nerd. Um, so we're looking at Hymenoptera, Vespa, Vespa Romandarinia, reference, oh, and I don't have, okay, well, I'm going to do a little, uh, Google search then. Right. We're looking at a very orange wasp here. So let's throw some of these into my reference application. Oh, that's a nice one. What I like about these things is they almost look like a toy. I mean, it's hard to tell the difference between these guys and an actual toy. Um, and they're nice and big. And I recently made a brooch for a friend of mine uh, based on this Hornet. So we'll take a look at that too. Okay. But now let's uh, hide this real quick and let's get our reference. I go images. So whenever I'm doing some poly painting, you know, the first thing I like to look at is just take a few minutes to take a look at some images. So these are grabbed from online. And I like to take a look, nice look at the variation in colors here, not just the details here, but how we go from nice transitions from yellow to dark reds. Uh, to oranges. Now a lot of this of course is also an artifact of subsurface scattering but at the same time you can kind of see the borders here. It's always important when you're looking at insects to see how the coloration can draw attention to certain parts of the animal. For example the mandibles right here. See how the teeth of the mandibles are this dark color? So you have this color contrast here 
Um, and uh, it just it kind of draws attention to, you know, let's just say the danger parts of our animal. Um, you also see a lot on the on the legs, especially around the joints, you'll get dark colors around the joints. And these are I, I think these are really interesting. And so this is what I, I love to do poly painting in ZBrush because I do find that the um, the poly paint brushes in ZBrush are, are, are excellent. So what I usually do when I'm when I'm doing an organism like this is I'll you know obviously I've already done all the sculpting on this guy, and he's actually if we go to like all low, um, I believe I've done everything up to including setting up UVs for this guy. So let's take a look at the head here, and uh, I'll just go down here to uh, UV map and do a quick. Oh, maybe I don't have any UVs on here. Let's take a look. Let me take it out. Texture map. Okay, so that one doesn't have UVs. Let's see. Well, we don't really need to worry about UVs right now, so let's just ignore that. We'll leave that for another time. But what we can do now is you just start with the head. So I'm going to turn on the solo button for the head. And let's set this all the way to the highest subdivision level. So at the highest subdivision level, we have 10 million polygons. And you can see I have a nice bit of sculpted detail on here. So I'm gonna take advantage of that sculpted detail when I deal with the poly paint, because as you can see, I can use masking, like cavity masking and curvature masking here to kind of isolate these parts. So let's get started. I'm gonna switch over to my um, white skin shade 4 material which is what i usually use when i'm uh when i'm poly painting because obviously it's white and it doesn't interfere with um with this yes it does not look like a bee because it is not a bee it's a japanese hornet killer of bees enemy of bees But you know, like I said, we all gotta make a living. So I'm just gonna pick a nice orange color here and set my RGB to 100% and I'll do color, fill object. And now I'm gonna pick up my paint brush and let's put in some settings here and lower my RGB intensity. Make sure Z add and Z sub is off because I don't wanna sculpt on this. I've already done the sculpting. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold the shift key and I'm gonna turn off Z add. I'm gonna use the shift key as a blur brush so that I can start to blend colors together. And I'll set my RGB intensity. Maybe I'll bring this down just a little bit, but I'll play with this throughout. Another thing I like to do when I'm painting is I like to have my, my blur brush, AKA the smooth brush, slightly larger than my paint brush. So you can do this. I'm gonna hold the shift key and go to the brush palette and down here under smooth brush modifiers, I'm gonna set the alt brush size to, let's say two. That means that my blur brush is always twice the size of my paintbrush. Or we can do, let's maybe two is a little bit too much. Let's do like 1.4 or something like that. There we go. Okay, so now um, let's take advantage of some of the sculpted detail in here. And I'm gonna do a very quick, some, some masking, just some tricks I do to, to lay down some color real quick. And I usually like to start the head with the head because, you know, it's where the personality is and uh, establish my colors there. And then I'll, I'll sample those colors for the rest of the body. Uh, but let's go to a cavity mask. I'm gonna set the intensity to 100 and do a mask by cavity. So you can see now all those nice little dots that I sculpted have now been masked. So let's invert that mask. I'm gonna press Control H to hide the mask. So the mask is still applied, it's just temporarily hidden. And I'm gonna pick like a dark reddish color and just do color fill object, just to get it in there. So now we have some nice detailing right there. I can uh, clear the mask and maybe, you know, hit the Shift key to maybe blur it just a little bit, just so it doesn't look too much like it's picking up artifacts from the polygons, but actually is, detail but at 10 million polygons this is already pretty good and you know a lot of poly painting techniques that I use I actually learned from way back in the day when I was taking classes with Madeline Spencer at the Noman School here in Hollywood and I even though we were talking about creatures and and characters and stuff in that class I still use a lot of these techniques um, for insect painting so let's try a mask by smoothness 
And let's see a whole lot there. So I'm going to bring up the range. And that one's probably not doing a whole lot. Let's see. Let's bring it down. I just like to play with these things. If it's not doing anything, then I don't care. Let's try mask by curvature. And you can see a little bit. I'm going to bring up the strength. You can see a little bit there. And I'm going to hit the uh, control I to invert it so you can kind of see the mask here. It's just a little bit more subtle, but we have some stuff on the edges here. So I might pick like a, a, a redder color, maybe something like this. And you know, I'm just laying down colors, just throwing, throwing them at the, the canvas and I'm going to blend them and play with them a, as we go. So just want to get something down here. So I'm going to hit the color uh, fill object. So you can see that redness is coming through right here. See how it's like in the cracks there. So I think that looks pretty cool and really getting some nice detail. So I always say poly painting until after I've done my sculpting so that I can take advantage of all that detail that I've sculpted in. So I'm going to, going to just blur this out a little bit and I'm going to layer colors on top of this which is going to give it kind of the impression of like a subsurface scattering even though I'm not using a subsurface scattering uh, material. Um, Next thing I'm going to do is maybe just paint some color here in the areas behind the eyes. So if I turn off the solo button, you can see stuff behind the eyes here. So, and we can do that kind of dark, dark red. Let's set the uh, paintbrush to color spray. I'm going to go in here and under the options for color spray, I'm going to set the uh, color this down here because this, this basically, this uh, this setting adds a uh, hue variation to the spray, but I don't want that. So I'm going to set it to zero so there's no variation. So I'm always getting the same um, same colors. And let me, I'll choose an alpha like that and just go in here, maybe bring up my RGB intensity a little bit and make sure I have uh, symmetry turned on and just very quickly kind of lay this out here. And it's going to be behind the eyes. And I, I want to do a little bit of spillover here onto the head itself so I can blend that around. And then same with right here. This is where the antenna come out. And then, you know, I like to do red color down here, down near the mandibles and the danger part where, where the mandibles come out. Again, it gives a little bit of drama, you know, that red redness near the, uh, near the danger zone. And then I'm just going to kind of quickly just go in here and just lay this down real quick on the back of the head. Okay. And do that. And this is the ocelli right here, these three little dots. So the ocelli are the additional eyes. So many flying insects will have their main compound eyes and then accompanied by ocelli. And ocelli, I actually have done a whole animation to explain what ocelli do. Um, but the short version is think of them as just bringing in a little bit of light to kind of help guide the insect where the sky is and also acts as, as uh, kind of like an uh, attitude adjustment so they can kind of see the horizon. Um, that's the theory anyways. They do serve a number of different purposes. So now that I have this, I'm going to get a yellow color, yellow orange. And I'm going to bring down the RGB intensity. Let me bring up the, uh, my scale, my brush, and I'm just going to start to go over this with this yellow color, maybe a little bit more. Masks in there. Okay, that's good. That's good. So if we look at our reference here again, you know, we want to look for that kind of nice variation in areas where we see a little bit lighter yellows, especially bringing out some of these details and the darker oranges, you know. Um, so we can do this. Mm 
I'm kind of noticing looking at this, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, I actually started sculpting this this uh, hornet a few months, well, actually last year. And so when you leave something alone for a while, then you start to notice when you come back, maybe some things that you missed. Like I'm really seeing this really cool sculpted detail here and I'm kind of wishing that I had put it in. This right here. So let's put it in. So let's take a quick break from poly painting and I'm going to go to... Uh, I always like this SK cloth brush, and I'm just going to kind of make it kind of wide, bring down the Z intensity, and just do this. So I really like that detail. It's really cool. I think it would be a shame not to have it. I don't know why I missed it the first time I sculpted this, but, you know, sometimes you just don't see these things. It has this nice kind of dark, deep line right here. Let's bring that out. And I kind of think, I have a lot of projects that I start and then they sit on my hard drive because I get busy with work or something else. And they get neglected for months at a time. And, uh, but, you know, I usually finish them sooner or later. I'm going to take my uh, Tomas Vittelsbox version of the clay brush, clay tubes, TW clay tubes. And let's make sure RGB is off. And I'll bring down the Z intensity. I'm just going to kind of flatten this a little bit just to match my reference. So it makes this a bit more dramatic, too. Definitely more interesting. Yeah, let's go back and do the SK cloth and really bring this out again. Okay. And then I want to bring in some of this detail. So I've lost some of this detail smoothing it out, but you know what I can do is I can down, go down here to my masking, mask by color, and let's do mask by poly paint. And I'm going to use the poly paint now to kind of bring out the details. And so I'm going to select something like this. So I'm just kind of dragging over here, kind of picking that dark reddish color so you can see where it's applying that mask and you can see what the mask looks like um, and then maybe adjust the tolerance a little bit something like that I'm going to invert the mask press H and let's go in here and I'll just take that, uh, that clay tubes brush and just lightly go over this whoops it's not light. Let's bring down the Z intensity a bit more. A little bit of smoothing. Of course, I turned off the add and the smoothing. I'm just kind of bringing out some of that detail a little bit. I'm going to hold the shift key, turn off RGB, and bring on Z add, and just smooth a little bit. And then let's clear that mask. A little bit more smoothing. There we go. So just kind of bringing some of that detail back. Another thing you can do is uh, 
Get our friend the Damien Standard Brush. And maybe do like drag rect, bring up the Z intensity. Turn off symmetry for a moment. Maybe bring down the focal shift and just, just add a few more of these little divots. just in this area. These little divots and that kind of stuff is what really makes the surface look interesting, especially when you get it into a render, like with Redshift or whatever. And you got your subsurface scattering on there and you've got a little bit of color in there. That's when that starts to really look cool and very realistic. Not yet, of course, but we're getting, we're getting on our way there. Um, where can I see the animation that you're talking about? Okay, well, since you asked, I never share a shy about plugging myself. It's going to be entomology animated. Um, there we go. So this is a website where I have a four part series on insect vision. And part one is basically talks about regular compound eye. Part two talks about firefly eyes. They tend to be uh, super superposition eyes, eyes that can see at dusk. And then part three is all about the ocelli. And uh, so you can check that out. So it's entomologyanimated.com. And uh, let me hit this real quick. Hit play, but let me turn down the volume. Okay, so. Anyways, I don't want to go too long on this, but basically in this case, I do use a honeybee as an example. So basically we're looking at the three little eyes right here in the top and it does this whole little thing where it dives in and you can see the sort of cellular vision and, and that kind of stuff. And that's the inside of the ocelli. So if you're curious, check out entomologyanimated.com. In the meantime, we'll go back to ZBrush. And let's go back to poly painting now that I've got that kind of out of the way. I'm gonna hold the shift key, turn off Z add, turn on RGB, just so I don't destroy the details I just came up with. And now uh, this is where I think it gets really fun. We can start to start to really play with color here. So I'm gonna turn um, turn which call it symmetry back on and maybe a sample. So if you want to sample a color that's on the surface, just hover over the color you want to sample, press the C hotkey and it will, it's just like the eyedropper in Photoshop. So I'm going to bring this in a little bit, you know, and I'll lose some color and paint over again and bring it back and do more masking tricks and that kind of stuff. So I don't have to get too hung up on it. So let's, uh, let's sample that yellow. Maybe make it a little bit brighter, a little bit more yellow, and bring down the RGB intensity. And just kind of start to bring this out a little bit. Yeah, just like that. You know, and every individual insect is going to have slight variations in color. Although sometimes I'm always surprised when you look at some insects at how consistent they are among individuals in some terms of coloring. So like a blue morpho moth is a good example. Um, <clears throat> like it always had these two little white dots in the wings or things like that so it's really interesting to see how specific they can get so I'm just kind of okay so what I want to do is I'm going to bring down the yellow here near the edge like this some of that variation and I think it's okay if some of the details you know fade in and out in terms of where they are on the surface I think that's okay too um, the other thing is when you're you know my intention is usually to eventually render this in redshift whether it's redshift here in ZBrush or redshift for Maya or Cinema 4D or sometimes 
I'll use um, Keyshot, but usually my goal is to render in Redshift. So that means that, especially with insects, we're going to have a lot of subsurface scattering to create that kind of, you know, the look of the uh, of the surface of the skill uh, of the uh, chitin, basically. And so that means if you're going to use a lot of subsurface scattering, then that means a lot. You really have to exaggerate the details or the color differences while you're in ZBrush, uh, because once you add that subsurface scattering, it can get very, uh, very subtle. It can get lost. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. I'm gonna bring this scale up a little bit. Here, a little chubby cheeks. It's not really cheeks, obviously. As close as you get to cheeks for insects. One of my favorite ants is a carpenter ant because it almost has like chubby cheeks. And uh, a great example of this, I'm not the only one who's noticed this because if you watch Ant-Man, when, when Ant-Man's daughter gets the pet ant, the giant pet ant, they chose a carpenter ant. And I think it's specifically because a carpenter ant has these cute little chubby cheeks. That's my guess anyways. I didn't work on the movie, so I can't say for sure, but it's the same decision I would have made. Um, the thing I liked about Ant-Man, I mean, obviously it's an entertaining movie and everything. The, the first and second one is pretty good. I haven't seen the third one. Um, and even though they got a few things kind of wrong for the sake of entertainment, one thing I do appreciate that they did a good job of is they really tried to emphasize that there's a diversity of ants and that different species of ants have different quote-unquote talents, you know. Some ants shoot acid out of their butts. Some ants have stingers that sting bases, alkaloids. Uh, obviously, leafcutter ants have big mandibles, and a leafcutter ant has a lot of variation within a single nest. Um, soldiers and nurses and that kind of stuff, and large soldiers and tiny minims and all that kind of stuff. Anyways, I know I'm rambling. So it's kind of a nice, you know, so we established it's kind of a baseline color. So you can see that, the, you know, the darker details here in these divots are going to be pretty subtle. Like I say, it's okay to have them exaggerated because the subsurface scattering is going to remove a lot of that. So now we can take a look at some of these details here, like this sort of dark brown rim here and these uh, dark brown dots and then some of the other parts right here. Um, I mean, some of these parts are the muscles for the mandibles, you know. Let's turn this on for a second. And okay, whoops. Let's go back to the head here, and I'm going to choose like a dark brown and let's uh i'm going to keep the color spray but i'm going to set the alpha to like this dot and then i'm going to choose the placement set this fairly low so that it's still um it's still a spray stroke and we get a little bit of a wobbly variation in there let's bring down the uh, focal shift and let's start to just paint this brown, dark brown color along the rim here. And I like this kind of detail right there. It looks like it gets kind of exaggerated right here too. The other thing I've noticed is when you're looking at reference for insects, um, be cognizant of whether you're looking at male or female. I believe that this is a female uh, if it has a stinger, it's a female, because a stinger is basically an, an adapted ovipositor. Um, but, you know, I made this mistake when I was working on a planetarium show a few years ago, and we had a fly, and so I had to model, like, a green bottle fly. And uh, I was working on the model. I thought it was looking pretty good. And then I showed it to my art director, and my art director was like, the eyes are too, too close together. <laughs> And I looked at my reference, I'm like, no, they're not. I had it absolutely perfect. And so we got into this big argument 
about the eyes. And we started looking at the reference and comparing the references, and his reference had all the eyes far apart, and my reference had all the eyes close together. And it was because he was looking at a male and I was looking at a female. And I didn't realize that and you have this, you actually have that significant a difference between the sexes of flies. So, just a cute little story to remind you to remember what you're, what you're looking at. Because with the reference, sometimes it can drive you crazy when you see a lot of like subtle differences that you don't, you don't notice. And this right here, I think we get this kind of. This. And the other thing is, is, you'll notice I'm doing everything with perfectly symmetrical at the moment. And uh, I'll do that, you know, partially kind of like, let's say it's out of, uh, I don't know, laziness. But what I'll do is I'll do a lot of the painting and the sculpting symmetrical at first for like the first, you know, 80%. And then what I'll do is later on, I'll come back and then start to paint in sort of asymmetry or sculpt in asymmetry, just because that's a lot faster. And sometimes the asymmetry is very subtle. So like these little, these little dots that I'm working on right here, you know, these are obviously asymmetrical in terms of their shape. Um, but right now I'm not going to worry about that. I'll worry about that a little bit later on after I get further in the process. So it's easy enough just to come back and kind of change that. I'm just sort of doing a little bit of random coloration there. Okay. So let's do like a, basically like a rim around the eyes here. <laughs> paint the eyes next because those look pretty cool. cool detail right here this line let's put that in there I'm also seeing a few parts of the muscle anatomy that I think I've left out of mine So in this case, I think there's a little bit of, uh, I'm going to switch brushes. I'm going to switch over to, uh, let's just do the standard brush. I'm going to turn on RGB, maybe bring down the RGB intensity a little bit. Let's get this to freehand and maybe make this a little bit harder edge. So like that, and I'm going to bring this down a little bit. And I'm going to set the Z intensity to Z sub and bring this up a little bit. It really looks like, you know, this is actually some kind of like channel. Maybe this is where the tears go once it realizes how how much damage it's doing to the poor bees. So bring down the intensity, that's too much. This is a really mild detail. And bring a little black into here. I don't know how far down this goes or where it goes, but let's have that for now. It looks like Alice Cooper or something. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go back and redo that. <laughs> Oops.
feel like I didn't quite get the curvature I wanted in there. Let's go back. Okay. I really want yes. I really want that S curve to come out. Yeah, that looks pretty cool. So you know, the other thing is, as I'm looking at this, you see how we are, we're starting to get like subtle greens in here as well. So it's not just straight up uh, orange and yellow. We actually have a little bit of that green in like this area. So I'm going to go back to my paintbrush and bring down the RGB intensity. Let's go back to this alpha right here. And I'm going to do kind of a yellowish green but not too saturated. And just bring this in just a little bit. some of this darkness in here. Yeah, this is like, if you look at this guy, he doesn't have these little dark brown dots. So some of them do, some of them don't. I'm gonna bring in some of that orange, deep reddish orange. It's tough because you look at a lot of different references. You get focused on one for a long time, then you switched over to another picture. You realize there's a, there's actually quite a few differences, so it's hard to know which way to go. Sooner or later, you just kind of have to make a decision. Go with whatever looks coolest, and then wait for some entomologist to come along and tell you that you're wrong, and then choose whether or not you want to listen to them. Okay, I think that's too pink.
Yeah, that's some nice variations of color there. So, <coughs> um, and then I'm going to do just a little bit of just like black, black down here to really intensify the drama. drama. I'm going to switch over to mandibles. Okay, so now what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to let's find my model. Okay, I'm going to select this one. The Ocelli right here, we can turn this on and just basically these guys right here I'm just going to those high subdivision level and I'm just going to fill them with this kind of reddish black color right here color fill object hmm. yeah that works okay and I'll click on the mandibles here and I'm going to hide everything except for the mandibles and the head. Keep the Ocelli on. Okay. So now, the mandibles, it's going to be kind of a similar process doing the head. It's just much more exaggerated reds and obviously the really deep black right here. You know, so those are the things I'm going to be looking at. I love this gradient. I mean, this gradient is fantastic going from the light yellow orange down to the red. That's that I think is really cool. Um, so, and I modeled it with it, modeled her with the mandibles open for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I'm gonna sample this orange color here, and then just do color, fill object, and then let's bring down the RGB intensity again, and I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna sample this dark red, reddish brown. Actually, it's not a bad idea to save. So let's do save next. Pardon for a second. So let's go back to our masking and mask by cavity, set the intensity up, mask by cavity, let's invert that, hide the mask, let's control H and do color object, something like that. That's exaggerated, I know, that's okay. Let's try mass by, let's see if mass by smoothness does anything. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna invert that. Maybe I'll just pick a yellowish color. Like I say, I'm just kind of throwing down some colors here to get started with. Fill in a couple times. Let's do an aspect curvature. I'm going to bring up the strength here. Again, that's going to be kind of blood red. You can see it's coming in there. And then also mass by peaks and valleys. I don't necessarily have a method to this. I just like to fool around, see what looks cool. So you know, bring in some of that dark red there. 
It also kind of saves time because it gets some detail going real quick and then I can just sort of, like I did over here, just start to paint over it. So now I'm going to sample like uh, some of that yellowish color and make sure we don't have mask apply. Let's bring up the RGB intensity a little bit. There we go. And we can, don't forget we can blend with our burn, uh, smooth brush. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat. As long as you don't ask me why I have a cut on my forehead. I got into a fight with a wall, and the wall won. Let's get some of this brownish color in here, and just, and the areas bring it in. Just do like a mask, peaks and valleys, invert the mask, and just, you know, bring that in every once in a while. Whoops. Maybe that's not what I want. Maybe let's do. and then just paint over it and start doing a fill. I'm just trying to bring back some of the detail that I lost. There we go, that works. I'm going to clear that mask and let's go down to this deadly black color. And I'll start to bring this in. And I'm going to go in here. Let's bring out the placement.
going for none more black. I haven't kept up with the news to see if the uh, Japanese Hornet invasion of the United States is still going on or whether that was a whole lot of hype. I think they found a few here in Oregon, here and there in Oregon, I mean LA, not Oregon. Um, but I don't know if it's actually a true invasion or they just found a few isolated hitchhikers. here. Let's go back to a reddish dark red and lower RGB intensity and blend it a little bit here. Yeah, it looks good. I like that gradient. Jesse McAllister, nice to see you again, or hear from you. It's been a minute. Okay. Bring some of that orange back, and maybe even a little bit of that bright yellow. That's looking pretty cool, looking pretty scary. And then I'm going to do some of that straight up black, black, black. Get the RGB intensity just along the edges here to really sell it. And that looks nice. Nice and scary. Let's save. You save next. Let's do the eyes next. I think the eyes are going to be fun. I mean, I love these little areas of dark pigment. This weird little pattern. I think that's just awesome. Looks really cool when you get it right in the render, too. Um, the eyes are the window to the soul, and insects have compound eyes, so I guess they got compounds. compound soul. That sounds like a great name for a funk album, by the way, Compound Soul. Let's see, I believe I should already have my pattern of Omatidia on here. It looks like I already actually did some painting on here a long time ago. Maybe I started doing it, but I think yeah, I must have started and then I forgot about it. Go figure. So what I'm going to do is let's sample some of this dark red and I'm going to make it a little bit lighter and I'm going to do
just to lighten him up a little bit. Too much. And then let's switch colors. I'm going to do a quick cavity mask. So this is the eyes here are 14 million, which is how I get the nice compound compound eye pattern here. Um, let's do a little matte cavity mask. I'm going to invert the mask. Let's hide the mask, and I'm just going to fill it this dark, dark red. It's subtle, but I just kind of want to bring out the uh, the bumps of the omatidia a little bit. So the omatidia are basically the, each one of these little dots that you see on the compound eye is a lens, and underneath that lens is like a little. I think it like, looks like a railroad spike, but it's a cell, and each one of those basically processes the light as it comes in to the eye. So what happens is it creates this mosaic pattern. It's not like each little lens sees its own vision of the world. It's more like, uh, think of this as being like pixels on a screen. So you get this, the more omatidia you have packed in there, the higher resolution image that the insect sees. So we get like dragonflies and stuff like that. They tend to have a lot of omatidia because they're flying predators and so they uh, they have higher resolution as opposed to you know insects that maybe burrow under the ground and they don't really care about seeing stuff as much so they might have fewer omatidia and really rely on vision as much as they do on sense of smell and stuff like that so let's bring up the RGB intensity a little bit yeah, it's like a dot matrix eyesight, I think is a, is a good way to put it. Like a dot matrix printer. You must be a child of the 80s. Interesting. No, I don't really use Z color that often. That's interesting. Huh. Well, there you go. I never even opened this up before. So I guess this is basically how you can use kind of like a specific color palettes or something. Interesting. I have not used that. I'll have to give it a try. I usually just kind of select things by what I think looks good. You know, back in the old days, you could teach everything you needed to know about ZBrush in about 10 weeks. Now forget about it. It takes like a year or two. It's just too much stuff in the program. Okay, so I'm kind of just like adding a little area of light color here because I want to bring in some of those dark patches, those dots. So obviously I have to bring up the color so that I can bring back those darker dots. So I might want to exaggerate this a bit, just because I know, like I said, if we get into a render and start putting subsurface scattering on here, the subtlety is going to get lost. It's just going to look like a flat color. So generally, my workflow, if I'm doing an insect all the way to something I want to render in Redshift for Maya, is I'll do all the poly painting in ZBrush. I'll generate displacement maps from ZBrush obviously after I got UVs and that kind of stuff. And then all the other maps I'll do either in Substance or in like Marmoset. I've been using, I was using Marmoset a lot. I'm kind of going back to Substance now uh, just because um, I like the painting tools and Substance Painter, I should say, Substance Painter to be specific. They're both really great programs. Sample this dark color here and bring it back a little bit on the edges. I 
The other thing we can do is, just for fun, let's go into the material palette. I'm still using this Skin Shade 4 material, but we can modify a little bit. Maybe bring up the specularity a bit. And... Let's see, is that doing anything? I see a little bit of that specular highlight. That gives me a nice idea of what it's going to look like. Oops. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so now. I'm going to go back to that really dark color. I'm going to go into my color spray and let's bring the placement down so it's a little bit tighter. And so now I'm going to start making some of these little black dots here. And we don't really need easy mouse. Now, I mean, as much time as I spent reading about insect eyes, I still don't quite know why we often see this pigment pattern on the eyes themselves. That's like another interesting area for research. So I haven't gotten into that part yet. I mean, I know if like you look at uh, praying mantises, right? They have the pseudo pupil, which is basically an optical illusion. You know, it looks like they're looking at you. You have these little black dots on there on the eyes, but that's just because you're essentially looking straight down the omatidia. But that's a different thing. This is, this is obviously a pigment change, and obviously in different bees and wasps and other insects, you'll see lots of different variations here, like dragonflies will have like stripes of color and stuff like that. So I'm not exactly sure what advantage these black dots give to the, to the insect. So if anybody knows, Type it in the chat, otherwise I'm going to have to do some more reading. All right, thank you, autosave. Oh. <clears throat> Tonight's live stream brought to you by beer. <clears throat> Do I do any mantis models? You know it. I've done a uh, orchid mantis, which I have a Noman Workshop series on. And I've done, you can see from the beginning of that animation, I showed you entomology animated, I've done the a green mantis, a juvenile stigmomantis limbata, which is a great, great name. Um, which is kind of like a typical mantis you'll see here in California. The green, beautiful green mantis when they're young and they tend to turn brown and it's older. But there's many more species of mantises that I need to do. And I've created some mantis, a mantis ring as well, some jewelry based on the mantis. So just take a quick break to plug another thing. I've got a Nomen workshop. And under instructor right here. I have this uh, Normal workshop series on creating a mantis. 
and it goes it's mostly zbrush this is all poly paint and zbrush uh, but I did the rest of the texturing in marmoset and the rendering in marmoset so it's got like uh, I don't know oh god 22 chapters because I can't shut up um, all about creating a cool orchid mantis like this one you see right here and I do talk a lot about insect anatomy at least what I know about it and all the various different things so if you're curious you want to get into insect modeling you can check out my series in the Newman workshop I also have one on this is an older one on a wasp um, and then I also have one on spiders jumping spider and this has uses Yeti fur but a lot of these are ZBrush based tutorials so if you're curious you can check those out I never, ever, ever get tired of modeling insects. And, you know, I do uh, a, a variety of insect models. So sometimes, you know, a lot of times, like this one I did from scratch, you know, like maybe a Z-sphere block up or something like that, and then modeling every part, just like I demonstrate in those series. And then other times I'll use scan data. Like right now I'm working on a project for a museum in Germany where they've, they've got the scan data, and it's like this ugly mess of goo. Um, and I turn it into uh, high quality models that, you know they could be used for animation or used for 3d printing or, or VR or something like that or just to have sort of like a digital asset and I think I really enjoy jobs like that they don't come very often but when they do they're a lot of fun because that's when you learn a lot about uh, insect anatomy and uh, you know it's nice to work with 3d scan data because when I'm modeling from scratch, I usually have to rely on, um, I have to rely on photographs, either ones that I take myself or ones that I find online or a little bit of both. And it's hard to find photographs of like the underside of a thorax of a female, uh, you know, mantis or something like that, you know, to get very specific. Um, and then I also rely on diagrams from books, older books, a lot. But it, then you have to transfer a 2D image, well, a 2D diagram into a three-dimensional part, which is not always easy. And you're also at the mercy of whoever illustrated the bug in the first place. You know, an illustration is, is going to be an interpretation. So they're going to use, you know, contour lines to define three-dimensional shapes. And sometimes it's not, you know, it's, it's a bit subjective, really. Um, however, the artist decided to draw that thing, that's their own interpretation of it. So that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, but I, I kind of like the challenge. Like, I do like to model things like the insect mouth parts. And I'm currently working on a series on honeybee mouth parts, which is a lot harder than it sounds. Again, because the shapes are so strange and so specific. Um, I believe uh, last year when I was doing a live stream, I was talking a lot about insect mouth parts. Okay, so I think that's okay, but a little, maybe a little bit too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a lighter color here. Let's uh, bring up the placement again and bring down the RGB intensity and just kind of just lightly go over it just to blend a bit more and make it look a little bit more natural here. Um, but yeah, working with scan data is a lot of fun and a great way to learn. And uh, if you go to a place like, you know, um, Sketchfab or something like that, you can find a lot of free insect models, scan, scan data online that you can download and use as a starting place. The scan data gives you a better idea of what the proportions are and also a lot of those more information on those hard to reach spots that you don't always get photographs of. So, um, it's also a really good job skill, being able to take scan data and turn it into a high quality usable model. Uh, I do that a lot, not just with insects, but a lot of times if I'm working on feature films or TV stuff or whatever, you're getting scan data of props and, and various other things. Like when I worked on the John Wick 4, I had a lot of scan data for you know, swords and that kind of stuff. And so it's a good job skill to have it's not super glamorous and sometimes it can be somewhat tedious, but a tedious day in ZBrush is not a bad way to make a living. 
definitely better than sitting in a meeting. The only time that one model that nearly drove me insane was I had to do a typewriter, an old style typewriter for the opening credits or the opening credit animation to the stand that they came out a couple years ago and that freaking typewriter nearly drove me insane. But I did most of it in ZBrush. Okay, let's see. I mean, it's not, I mean, it looks a little bit goofy. Um, but like I say, it's kind of exaggerated. You get it into a redshift render, it's going to be a bit more subtle with the subsurface scattering and also the reflectivity. So I'm going to kind of leave it like that, even though it looks a little bit strange in ZBrush. You can always change it later, obviously. Um, I might come in here, though, and just I'm gonna sample that dark color and just do a little bit. Line this out a little bit. They don't want it to look too well defined. It's going to blur it too a little bit. Okay. Let's save. Uh. Oh yeah, the frog. I love sculpting frogs. I've only done a couple, but they're fun. And poly painting a tree frog, that's a great exercise too. Vibrant colors and all the subtlety and variations and stuff. Okay, so next let's do antennae. And once again, let's take a look at reference. Okay, so with the reference here, it's kind of very pretty too. Again, we have these nice little gradients. This is the, uh, let's take a look at some of the other ones. You know, insects, as they get older, they tend to get darker in color. These seem to be relatively consistent. So it seems like we have oranges and light colors in the tip here, but mostly black in the segments. I like this. I like this one. So here's a good example of where you want to make sure you pay attention to the color variation because at the end of each one of these, you can see it's a lighter color and it's darker here. So you get this little contrast there. It helps really uh, make the... Uh, the transition more apparent, you know, and this, this is a good cause for doing like, you know, if I do this in substance and I'm doing a specular map, paying attention to these areas where you had these little bits of smoothness as opposed to the roughness, that really helps to sell the realism of the, uh, of the animal, like right here. You get think of this right here, or the base of the antenna is like the lower eyelid on a human, you know, you get that sort of wetness there that really draws attention to it, you know. Uh, I know that's probably a weird way to look at it, but, you know, there's other smooth parts right here that you want to pay attention to when you're doing the specular maps. And I've also done specular maps before in ZBrush where you just paint black and white uh, colors. Um, so, I may have left out a few parts of the anatomy there. You know, when I sculpted this last year or however many months ago, I can't remember if I actually declared it finished or not. Maybe I did, but I think there's a few more parts that need to be added. Like I'm missing, I'm missing that, that right here, which I think is really cool. So let's, let's try sculpting that in real quick, just for the heck of it. <clears throat> so I'm going to use the, uh, one of my favorite brushes, the SK cloth. SK stands for, uh, Sakaki Kuro famous ZBrush art artist. He does a lot of anime type stuff. And it's worth checking out his Gumroad. Uh, 
Um, okay, so let's bring up let's see intensity a bit. Make sure, make sure. There we go. I'm going to drop polypain for a second. And let's switch that to the material. There we go. Too much. Looks cool, anyways. I mean, insects are still nature's robots, you know. <laughs> okay. So, for the antenna, let's uh, sample some of this. Let's sample some of this darker color. So, just press C, darker. I don't know whether burnt umber or something. I don't know. Um, and then let's do color, fill object. Whoops, wrong object. Alt click on that. Switch subtools, color, fill object. There we go. Um, and then let's make sure we're going to use the right brush. Paintbrush. And shift key. Let's make sure we're blurring and not smoothing. And now I'm going to sample some of that light orange. And just to lightly bring this in here. Use that blur brush to kind of blend. Get some red in there. Yeah, that looks pretty cool. And then some black. Turn out the solo button and just. Okay, so I've already made these polygroups. Very smart of me. So I'm going to go into the brush palette and under auto masking and do mask by polygroups. That way it's going to be very easy, you know, especially when I get to these parts where I have transitions from one to the next. 
doing mass by polygroups makes it easier so I can paint on this one without affecting this one. I can just go up here and do the same thing Oops. like that. Um, so it's going to always, it's masking based on whatever polygroup you first brush on. So that's going to be really helpful for segmented stuff like this. Let me see. how This is one million polygons for the antenna. I'm going to divide it another time because I think I could do seven million. I want to make sure I got enough, enough polygons to support the uh, color detail here. And then... Intensity a little bit. I think these gradients look really cool. The like candy corn, man. If you had a choice between putting a live spider in your mouth or candy corn, which would it be? I don't know, live spider, right? Because candy corn is horrible. I think candy corn still exists just because there's some sadist in charge of a candy company. Oh, okay, so I have a question here, which is a good one. Uh, the retopology of organic creatures done using an automated tool like zero measure and then adjusted manually, would you use it manually from the start? Um, do, oh, okay, a couple questions here that I missed. Uh, any tablets, touchscreens work with sculpting? Uh, yeah, I use a Cintiq right now. Um, I actually have a couple Cintiqs, and, and I prefer to... to sculpt directly on the screen as opposed to using a tablet. That's my preferred way to do it. So yes, definitely Cintiq is great for that. Um, and then the other question is, is about um, zero measure. So one of the advantages of insects is that since their faces and other parts don't deform as much as say like human face or a mammal or another type of animal, you can get away with the topology a little. It's more like hard surface it's like organic hard surface, which is one of the things I like about it. But it also means that you don't have to be quite like, if you're going to animate a character, a human face, then your topology has to be spot on in order to support all the various different deformations that an animation is going to encounter. Whereas an insect model, it's like a robot. So in that case, the topology only has to support the detail. So it really depends certain parts of the insect where I'm really paying attention to um, like the edge loops and that kind of thing I'll do like a hand retopology by hand I mean you know one polygon at a time so what I might do is sculpt out uh, something using DynaMesh and then maybe I'll do a quick Z remesh and then if that's not good enough then I'll use Z Modeler and ZBrush to do a hand topology or I used to take it into Maya and do like a uh, use the quad draw with the modeling toolkit. Uh, but I found that that Z modeler works really well for doing um, uh, hand topology. So I tend to use that more just so I don't have to constantly go back and forth between ZBrush and, and Maya. Um, but these days, you know, Z remesher has gotten so good that in some cases, um, you can get away with just doing that and if like if I'm looking at like the antenna here you know I think this this is probably Z remesh but these are basically just cylinders right so Z remesh is pretty good at handling that and you can always use polygroups as a way to kind of guide how Z remesh works so if you have this you know a cylinder you could make the cap one polygroup the other side another polygroup and then do Z remesh with keep groups on and then those two polygroups will kind of guide the topology to make sure that you have nice kind of straight rows the problem with doing something like this or actually any Z remesh is when you get into when it creates like spirals of geometry and that makes it hard to unwrap for doing UVs and so, but I, you know, the later versions of ZBrush has gotten better and better, so spirals don't happen as quite as much as they used to. 
but you know, avoiding spirals so that it's easier to unwrap for UVing is a good argument for doing like a hand retopology, if that makes any sense. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, it's a good point. Um, strange how the outer limits of the chitin has a lighter color hue to it for some reason. I think part of it is how the chitin ages, but also that is what leads to the coloration of the insect. And as I mentioned earlier, um, in, in, in one way it helps draw attention to various parts, this contrast in color. If we have a dark color here and a light color here, the eye, whether it's your eye or another animal's eye is going to be drawn to that, which could be used as kind of a, a way of thinking of in terms of like a warning signal, like danger, because insects obviously use color as a way to warn predators that maybe they're venomous or sorry, poisonous, or that they taste bad, or that they're mimicking and another insect that is poisonous or tastes bad. And yeah, I mean poisonous by in terms of like, if you eat it, it will kill you. Um, but I've also noticed that if you look at insects overall, you know, you're going to have, it's the more important thing is the, is the contrast. In other words, some insects will have the reverse where maybe the outer parts will be a dark color and the inner parts or the joints will be a light color. And then sometimes you'll see the reverse of that. So I think a lot of it is, is sort of that contrast is the thing that's the most important thing to pay attention to. But um, it can be subtle or it can be very not subtle, but it's, it's one of those things that makes poly painting is such a joy because it's fun to like really get into that kind of stuff and see if you can kind of create these uh, gradients. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Okay, so I want to get some black in here. Very, very dark red. Like I say, I'm going to take advantage of that mask by poly group here so that I can paint on this little ball part without affecting the other. And I wanted to bring a little bit of that down here, like this kind of thing. A lot of times what I'll do is, you know, take these color maps and uh, in Substance Painter or Photoshop or whatever and, and I'll adjust them and turn them, you know, make a copies of it and adjust them and use that for subsurface scattering maps in my final render. I mean, Redshift for ZBrush is pretty good, but at the moment you can't really use texture maps as you can, as efficiently as you can in, say, Maya or Cinema 4D or Blender. I believe there's a redshift for Blender too. Well, the Blender has some pretty nice rendering to it as well. So. I use a uh, key shot basically when I do want to do a quick, fast render and I don't feel like messing with a whole lot of texture maps or that kind of stuff because you can send it directly from uh, from ZBrush into KeyShots. So it's a great way to quickly check your model or if you you need to send something to a client quickly uh, KeyShot is really great for that.
And the other thing that, you know, when doing insects that really sells it is hair. Even on insects that don't look terribly hairy, there's always a little bit of hair. Um, and, you know, an example, this is not nearly as hairy as a bee, but you have some right there. But whether you do that with fiber mesh or paint effects or X-Gen, I tend to use Yeti. Um, having that hair is really important. It's, it's almost like if you model a character, a human character, and you don't do the eyelashes, it's always going to look slightly wrong and weird. Even if it's a male character with light eye eyelashes, it just doesn't look right until you put those eyelashes in. Same thing with insects. Even an insect that doesn't look terribly hairy, just a few hairs here and there really help to sell it, especially if you render with like, you know, a depth of field blurring or something like that on there because it really just, you know, it kind of seals the deal. Um, some are easier than others. If you're doing like a scorpion, like a desert scorpion, that's super easy because the hair tends to be pretty much the same color and kind of sparse kind of evenly distributed throughout the body. There's some patches that are more dense than others, but for the most part, it's pretty easy to do. Honeybee, on the other hand, is mostly hair, and I'm still not quite happy with my honeybee models. Um, and it's mostly because I'm still trying to get the hair exactly right. Um, it's tough because honeybees are something where everybody's really familiar with. Um, so if it doesn't look quite right, people can tell on some level. So I'm just doing a little cavity masking here just so I can quickly add some dark splotches. Something I meant to do earlier, but I kind of forgot. So I'm just gonna fill the color there. Is that actually doing anything? There we go. There we go. That looks nice. Okay. The other thing is when you're rendering insects, you know, I, I spend a lot of time looking at macro photography and doing macro photography, and I have friends who are really amazing macro photographers and literally traveled all over the place to study macro photography. So you pick up a lot of tricks that way. I'm not necessarily a great photographer by any means, but just being out in the field and looking through the camera at a bug, you learn a lot about composition because you can sit there and mess with the composition of the frame and take, you know, 50, 100, 1,000 pictures with different settings and different ways of framing it. And then when you come back to actually render your bugs, you have a lot of ideas, not only in your reference library, but also just in your subconscious from just doing that. So I highly recommend doing that. But <clears throat> one of the tricks of macro photographers is to, you know, go out early in the morning when the dew is still out there and the, the bugs are kind of just waking up because yes, they do sleep in the night. And they're covered with, with little water droplets. It's something that makes it gives a magical appearance. You often see dragonfly or damselfly images with water droplets on there. So I threw that in my renderings a lot too, because it's easy and it looks really nice. Um, when sending out the color maps, are you able to uh, set the color space to ZBrush support AC? No, uh, we, basically, I use. Um, Z plugin, multi map exporter, which is pretty simple for the texture map. It's pretty much straight up the colors that you paint on there. Um, so, their export options, not really much for texture, and I don't know if there's any of the preferences. So, basically, if you're dealing with color space, that might be something I would do, try and do in uh, either in Maya when you know you're setting up your texture maps and you can you can set the color space there or in Substance Painter. Uh, color space is something I really hate dealing with because um, I just like colors. Um, but I don't think there's many controls as the interface color within ZBrush for setting up a particular color space. If anybody has an answer for that, you know, let me know.
Um, the question is, do you just send the color maps over to Painter? I do color and displacement in ZBrush. Normal maps in ZBrush, um, I hate to say it, but they're just not very good. They come out mushy. A long time ago, there used to be a much more complicated plugin for creating normal maps from ZBrush, and it made some really nice normal maps. Uh, but they simplified it, and in the process of simplifying it, they made the normal maps are just eh, they're not as great. So normal maps I will do in Substance Painter, but displacement um, I will definitely do here in ZBrush. The thing about displacement maps in ZBrush, though, is um, they're really excellent, but you have a choice. You can send them out as uh, EXRs or TIFFs or PS PSDs, and you have a choice. You could do... You know, I use the, uh, use the multi-map exporter. So if you take just a quick look at displacement, you can do vector displacement as well, but I, I often just stick to regular displacement. But if I go into the options for displacement maps, right, uh, down here you have the choice. You can do three channels, 32-bit EXR, which is great, and those tend to be really good displacement maps. The only problem is, is these options right here. So the subtools and merge maps. So... If you take a look at this model, it's a lot of subtools, right? I mean, these are just folders and all these different parts, lots and lots of subtools. So what this can do, multi-map exporter, is if you have these options on, it will do all the subtools, all the subtools you have visibility turned on for. It'll just go through and make all the maps. So you don't have to go and make them individually, which is awesome. And then let's say you have like your color maps or your UV shells are broken up between different subtools. It will automatically merge those. Also awesome, huge time saver. And on top of that, um, it will also support UDIMs. So if your model has a whole bunch of UDIMs, you can't really see them in ZBrush properly, but it's still ZBrush will um, support UDIMs. So again, that's great. So you're making displacement maps for all your various subtools. You turn these guys on, set your size, and come down here and set your options and then export. The problem is if you want to do 32-bit EXRs, which I frequently do because they come out looking really nice from ZBrush, then you can't use the merge maps option, which is a big bummer. So that means that I generally, unless they've changed it in a later version of ZBrush, I don't know, but generally if I'm doing 32-bit EXRs, displacement maps from ZBrush, I usually have to spend some time in Photoshop merging the maps to get them all you know if i have uv maps spread you know several different sub tools are all packed into one texture space i gotta go into photoshop and kind of put those together which is a pain in the ass so sometimes if i'm feeling really light lazy i'll do 16-bit displacement maps which work usually just fine but and i hope that answers your question Okay, let's make sure I haven't got too lost here. Let's bring back some of this dark color. Okay, so now let's sample some of that yellow. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to doing this. Actually, what I should do is just knock all these out real quick. These displacement maps these days are a lot easier than they used to be back in the old days of mental ray and stuff. What a pain in the butt they were. And then sometimes if I want to do something like I'm maybe I'm doing a really quick, like I just want to do a nice render of a bug. I mean, usually when I'm doing a bug, I will go all the way. In other words, I'll make a model that has high and, and low resolution versions and I'll bring it into Maya, set up the EVs properly, UDIMs and all that. And I'll even create an animation rig and everything, hair and so on. And uh, so I have a library of some of these insects and those those models are really handy because I spend a lot of time setting everything up correctly. Then I always have that model I can go back to and create an animation from or even sometimes I'll have someone, uh, you know, want to buy one of the models for use in a TV show or a movie. Yeah, it's always nice to get a little bit of extra cash for something that you did maybe two years ago and it's just been sitting on your hard drive. But it, the best part is, of course, you can always 
you know, make an animation or a new render. But every once in a while, if I'm rushed for time and I just want to make a really cool image for whatever reason, uh, instead of using displaced maps, I might just do decimation, you know, pose it in ZBrush, decimate it, and send it out to Maya to render that way. Or obviously these days you can render Redshift within ZBrush as well. And you know, you can still set up your UVs. If you look at um, Decimation Master, this Keep UVs option is really great because if you set up your UVs with your non-decimated version and then you decimate, turn on that Keep UVs, then any of the same texture maps that you've used for your model here and the non-decimated version will work on the decimated version. And it works pretty well. I haven't noticed too many problems with like seams or that kind of stuff. So decimation is a nice way to do a quick and dirty high-res model if you need it. And of course, a lot of times when I'm sending models out to be baked in a substance, my high-resolution version will be um, a decimated version. Excuse me. All right, so we're coming up towards the end here of my live session. Just a few more minutes. I want to thank everybody for coming in and watching and asking great questions. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I want to apologize for the beginning. It was a bit of a rough start because I haven't done this in quite a few months, so I had to go back and change all my settings and get them all right, and that took me a few minutes to get correct, so I hate flubbing around and futzing with that kind of stuff. Thanks a lot to Kyle for coming in and helping me out and just making sure that my settings are right and testing everything. So I'm going to be doing this next Wednesday night, same same bat time, same bat channel, uh, 9 to 11 p.m. I'm going to be doing two more live streams this month. So uh, next Wednesday and then two weeks from that Wednesday because obviously I'm not going to do Thanksgiving week. Um, so I hope you join me for that. I'm going to continue with this project. Uh, doing the poly painting. Uh, I might mix in some other bugs here and there just to break it up. Um, but I really appreciate you uh, spending the time watching me do this stuff and I hope it's been enjoyable and you've gotten some cool ideas as well, of course, as an appreciation for the wonderful world of insects and arachnids. And uh, cool. So thanks very much and I will see you guys next time. Just got a few more minutes here so we're going to see how much more I can get in here before we're done. The other thing I, I you know, um, I want to point out is that I also, you know, speaking of making these high quality models, um, let me say this, say this real quick. Um, I want to show very quickly a, a brooch that I created for a friend of mine. So uh, I create um, jewelry as well as uh, animation models, and my jewelry th stuff is, of course, insect theme. And so I created this brooch right here, uh, same model. Obviously, I stylized it. This is an earlier version, but I actually cast this in silver for a friend of mine. It came out really nice, but it's just an argument for building up a library of your favorite subject because you can always repurpose them for something else. And other, in, in this case, I use the same model and just simplified it and then turned it into something that was castable and printable. So I'll talk about that a little bit next time as well. Um, thanks again. It's good to be back, and I really appreciate all of your support. Um, it's been really great. And thanks again to Maxon, Pixelogic, and all the great people who make ZBrush. Uh, we love you guys. Keep up the good work, and we're looking forward to, I believe there's a new version coming out soon, so... We'll see that soon.
and I'm just trying to fill up the last two minutes because I suffer from OCD. Oh yeah, the last thing I want to mention since I have one minute left is uh, I do have some courses available on Udemy. Um, check it out. They're jewelry for, I mean, ZBrush for jewelry design, but they're also intro courses. And if you're interested, you can check them out. So just look up uh, yeah, ZBrush for jewelry designers. I have an intro course of fundamentals and I have three courses available on Udemy. ZBrush for jewelry designers, understanding the fundamentals, understanding ZBrush geometry and how to create a printable violin. And I'll have some more soon and follow me on Instagram too. All right, guys. Thanks very much. And I'll talk to you soon.